as long as the technology is there, as long as it's part of our value chain, we'll invest. I don't know, in any particular case, you may not believe yourself that direct marketing is a good choice. That's exactly why the solutions which we're bringing, and it's not one solution, but a plethora of different complementary solutions. You know what, guys? In this particular industry, it won't really take off for the next five years. However, we need now about 30 million in funding to start investing in each and every startup which we see promising. Great clarification. Thanks a lot, Vadim. Good day to everyone. This is Venture Investor Economic Forecast by InMind. And today, our guest is a founder and managing partner of Advanced Autonomous Solutions Fund and managing director of TUS Asset Management Group from Hong Kong, Vadim Tarasov. Hi, Vadim. Hey there, Nelly. Thank you for being with us today. And uh, as far as I know, you are now in Japan uh, in the lockdown, planning to come back to Europe in a few weeks, correct? Well, indeed. I mean, you can hardly call it a lockdown when it comes to Japan, as Japan is pretty open for business and everything else. It's the other countries which are sort of closed and not really allowing to travel without restrictions. Great to hear that. Uh, so while you're in Japan, are you um, working there in, with the local VC industry as well? I have several meetings with uh, different VC funds and different strategic groups precisely in regards to the, to the new fund, which is now being finalized, uh, the setup of which is being now finalized. Uh, and the rest is obviously remote. Vadim, that was my other question. I would uh, be uh, very interested to learn more, as well as our uh, listeners, I guess, uh, about your new fund you're establishing, because TUS Group is quite uh, well established and uh, all the business, uh, asset management uh, and uh, fund business, but uh, the Autonomous Solutions Fund is a new uh, venture. So can you please uh, uh, give more details uh, about uh, its uh, investment strategy, model, uh, and uh, uh, about the plans for 2020? Sure. Well, maybe I'll start even with a brief introduction of what TUS Asset Management is. TUS Asset Management is part of uh, TUS Group, uh, which is a very large uh, Chinese slash Hong Kongese slash Macaoese uh, group with both public and uh, private stakeholders as the founding partners. Uh, and uh, this group has several different funds. One of the most active funds these days is a fund investing anywhere between uh, 30 and up to 150 million in late stage European companies, all European and Asian uh, companies, um, basically mostly focusing on technologically enabled uh, companies. Um, and we're setting up a few other funds aside of the autonomous, uh, advanced autonomous solutions fund. But coming back to the, uh, to the funding question. So it's actually an amalgamation of my own private activity and the uh, support of uh, TUS Asset Management Group. So for the past maybe four years, I've been investing in uh, deep tech companies pretty much across the board. A couple in new materials, a couple in robotics. Um, all are good, right? So it's, uh, but they were a little bit scattered across the board. However, over the past year and a half, maybe a very clear trend or an opportunity has emerged. The trend of basically automation of pretty much everything from manufacturing to uh, logistics uh, to whatever other uh, processes like security and whatnot. So in this sense, if you looked, I don't know, three years back in time, and you talked about drones, there were two very different categories of drones. One are the small toys like DJIs and whatnot, uh, which people used for fun. And then the other, on the very other end of the spectrum, something which was very much related to either government or military activities. Huge UAVs armed with missiles and whatnot. And there was a huge gap in between. 
pretty much nothing, some small and shy attempts here and there. However, over the course of the past year, year and a half, things have started to change fast. And uh, the COVID pandemic has pretty much accelerated these changes. So right now, a very broad spectrum of services, starting from autonomous inspections to delivery of medical goods and delivery of other items have emerged. And here we see uh, a very interesting trend. There are lots of trials and some of those trials are very successful and some of those trials are uh, amazingly beautiful, like delivery of a piece of cargo of whatever, five or 10 kilograms over a distance of 500 kilometers in a fully autonomous mode. However, it ends there. It ends with this successful trials, a really good press coverage, and nothing else happened. And the reason is that basically people have demonstrated they solved one piece of the puzzle, but the rest of it still requires a lot of manual interaction. So let's say if today I come to Amazon or Rakuten or whoever else in the world and I say, you know what? I have those beautiful drones, they can deliver any piece of goods for you. And they will immediately say, okay, this is good, it's amazing, we've been trying with our own drones and have some successes as well. However, the process isn't really autonomous, is it? Even though you can take off, you can fly and you can land autonomously. But what about the rest of the process? Like, how are we gonna recharge the drone? Do we need somebody to come and manually switch the batteries? What about uh, the collision? What happens if the drone collides with something in the air? What about delivery of the package? What happens if the delivery is not very accurate and the package which weighs five kilograms is dropped on the head of a child? Uh, so it results in a very ugly accident, if not worse, and then the whole program is screwed, right? So all of the things are a big unsolvable problem at the moment. A, not fully automated, B, with a lot of potential dangers and potential lawsuits and whatnot. So you're not really solving anything. At the same time, we see that there are a bunch of different companies around us which automate this or that part of this entire process. And that's what the fund is supposed to do. It's going to invest in companies which together solve one particular problem, but solve it end to end without leaving any gap in it. I like um, storytelling around the concept. And uh, can you please elaborate a little bit more? Is it a new concept for the VC industry in general, uh, making this uh, investment uh, in, the, um, in the whole sector uh, with connected uh, cr cross industrial startups, uh, etc.? I would say it's definitely unusual. I wouldn't say it's absolutely new. So there are some funds which are called like thesis fund and this, these are the funds which work around a certain thesis and they just invest in a lot of companies. Maybe this is one of the very few funds which actually is trying to completely solve an entire puzzle. Um, and again, maybe I didn't do enough research on the other funds of similar, of similar structure, but this one, and we've talked with our founding LPs, which there are a couple of those, and the concept makes sense for them. So it's not something which they would say, like, why are you doing this? It actually makes perfect sense. Um, and it vastly decreases the risk around the fund. So we're not investing in a hope that the companies will figure everything out themselves, which hopefully each of the companies will, right? It's uh, like all of the companies we're looking at or have already invested in are companies with existing ongoing business, right? So they're gonna do all right on their own. However, we bring to them an additional value add as a fund. We combine their solutions with other solutions and we come and we also help them with selling of this entire basically outsource process, so to say. And again, it's not our pipe dream, right? So it's not something which we think is cool, but doesn't have any industry validation. So the reason why I'm saying this is that even today, we have several different requests for this functionality, which we're enabling 
across several different portfolio companies. Uh, if things go right, and again, this unfortunately is affected by the situation with the travel and the coronavirus, as probably everything in this world today. Um, but most likely we're going to do a let's say like a pre-production test case somewhere in August with a very large company which shows or showcases the combined use of autonomous wireless charging, ultra high precision landing and amazing drones, uh, all for disrupting the last mile logistics and delivery industry. Mm -hmm. uh, how big will be the fund? Uh, so the first fund is going to be 100 million with the first closing of 50 million. And basically most part of this closing is already uh, signed up for in the firm commitments. And even as we're setting this fund up, I'm in parallel doing the investments in a private manner uh, together with a few uh, partners, uh, co-founders of the fund in the companies which fit this thesis. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Vadim, that's uh, amazing. It is not already first time I uh, see that uh, during the pandemic, during the lockdown, uh, new funds are established and they actually don't uh, feel the lack of uh, private money coming in. Um, do you think that's because uh, of your personal track record and successful deals behind uh, or maybe that's because uh, the timing is very good and many people understand now that uh, the drone industry can boost in the nearest uh, three, five years? Uh, I believe it's a combination, a little bit of both. There are a few LPs which have uh, agreed to invest because they know me personally and they had a positive track record of uh, me investing their money in certain companies. But then again, there is a vast layer of people who just look at the concept and say, you know what, that makes sense. So it's a combination of uh, kind of a proven experience plus people who really believe in the thesis. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, there was a case where I've reached out uh, to a founder of a very large and pretty well-known fund uh, to invite him as an advisor on the board of this fund. And um, while he said, look, the idea is fabulous. Unfortunately, I really cannot join as an advisor to a fund because it's like sort of competing activity. However, if you ever decided to change and to build out this fund within the scope of our group, we would more than welcome that. So for me, this was a really good validation of the entire concept of the fund. So actually you got an offer to build uh, this fund, but within uh, the investment group, which exists in... Uh, okay. Yeah, between, uh, let's say from a different, from a very different group, but again, for a number of reasons, obviously that's, uh, that's not possible. So I limited myself with politely saying thank you. And uh, <laughs> it's a pity though that this particular person didn't join as advisor because he would have added a lot of value, I would say. It sounds really cool and um, uh, let's let's structure the conversation the following way actually uh, in our YouTube channel we have uh, two uh, types of audience uh, one the biggest one and the most advanced are the startup founders uh, many of them are VC backed already others are planning to pitch to VCs and of course the majority of content we produced uh, was uh, for them uh, but uh, during our recent interviews, as a result, we noticed that um, we have uh, quite an audience of uh, angel and private investors also watching our uh, videos and interviews and uh, sometimes um, asking us to introduce with uh, uh, startups or investors with whom we uh, communicated during the interview. So uh, therefore, if we already started uh, the topic of uh, the PC fund structure, etc., cetera, now let's uh, in this first uh, part focus on the investors audience. And uh, in the second, uh, switch uh, on to the questions from startup founders. Uh, so uh, for investors in particular, if it is a not, uh, nothing around confidential information, can you give a little bit more information of what is the uh, minimum check or limitations or what uh, is your ideal uh, LP 
uh, portrait uh, which you would like to see in uh, your fund? So sure, actually the LPs uh, uh, for me are split in two different categories. One is purely financial LP, and there it's uh, basically the minimum check is gonna be five million, and we don't really, I'm not really interested in dealing with anything smaller than that. However, if there is a strategic angle, like for example, this is somebody who's been involved in the logistics industry. I don't really care how much money is being contributed in this sense, as long as the investor also commits to contribute a little bit of his time towards, let's say, some, some form of advisory activity for the fund. Like, for example, if we need to understand the economics of a certain uh, part of the industry, etc., his vision or his input would be uh, quite valuable. So if there is a strategic angle, we don't really care, so to say. Nor are we purely limited to LP type of, uh, let's say, collaboration. We're absolutely open to co-investors in general who would join us in the investment in certain startups if they don't want to invest in the entire kind of concept of the fund, by all means, let them join as a non-lead investors, obviously, as co-investors in the companies, in the particular companies we're investing in. So we don't have anything against it. We're not, we're not greedy, so to say. Um, do, do you also, uh, read, are you also ready to collaborate with um, syndicate funds or angel clubs, uh, which uh, we have quite a lot in Europe? Uh, by all means, again, for me, as long as they are not, so to say, not in the driver's seat, but they're in the co-investor seat, as long as they don't affect uh, the overall strategy and the approach when it comes to certain investment, we more than welcome that. Awesome. So if um, um, you are an investor, an angel investor who is watching this video interview and uh, interested to co-invest with Vadim together or become uh, the part uh, of uh, the fund itself as an LP, um, contact Vadim, we will put his um, LinkedIn profile in the description or contact in mind and we will introduce you directly. Uh, don't hesitate. Also, the same goes for anybody who is involved uh, heavily in logistics industry, uh, in the drone industry, uh, and in, let's say, last mile delivery one way or another. So all of these areas are of interest in general for advisory and other sort of collaborations. Great. Speaking about the drone industry, as far as I understand, uh, however, I'm not the expert in this field, but now, I heard that one of the barriers of uh, the huge development of this industry last year was a regulator, a regulator itself. Um, how do you think, or maybe you have some insights uh, being uh, very much involved, uh, will we see some changes uh, in the nearest future? Well, I mean, on the one end, yes, regulations are definitely one of the reasons uh, why the industry is underdeveloped in many countries. And here, the whole process is split into different regions and the policies which are applicable to each region. So you have the US where you have uh, basically a bunch of exemptions and permits for certain companies to execute certain type of uh, operations using unmanned aircrafts. Again, certain weight limitations, um, altitude, corridors, etc., etc. right? But little by little, the whole industry is going to be going into pretty much uh, very standard type of operations. I would give it maybe three, four years. Uh, Europe will follow suit. Uh, so uh, it's gonna be absolutely the same in the next three years, I would say as well. Uh, but even today we have regions like Latin America, Africa, Asia, uh, Russia, where on the one end, there are regulations on the other end um, they're not too strict and you need to basically reach an agreement with one certain uh, organization in each particular country uh, and you have not free skies but uh, let's say a certain freedom to operate also depending on um, the particular segment of the industry um, you're can even operate together with a large 
corporation. Again, sorry, I'm choosing the words here not to give out certain names, but in, in many cases, you can reach an agreement with a certain company and you can operate within its premises. Here is where we'll talk, be talking about industrial logistics um, or emergency rescue cases uh, where you would be delivering something. But in each of these cases, uh, they're still concerned about minimizing any sort of, you know, uh, rate of accidents of imprecise deliveries and whatnot. And that's exactly why the solutions which we're bringing, and it's not one solution, but a plethora of different complementary solutions, they make a difference. So this is why hopefully within the next six months, you'll see our, um, let's say combined solution operating in at least a few locations. I more than agree with you that it seems in uh, developing, so-called developing regions, uh, the drone industry, with the big territories, uh, the drone industry is uh, more demanded and maybe even more advanced in the implementation side, I mean. Um, not long ago, we had uh, the Agritech Challenge in Africa together with the World Bank, and we have noticed that there are a lot of startups working with uh, drones in agri-tech industry, uh, collecting information uh, with drones, um, information about the crops, etc., analyzing data. Um, when uh, you say you invest in the whole sector or um, cycle of this drone industry, do you also invest in the companies which make applications for drones or use drones for certain applications or industrial needs uh, but do not produce drones or elements for drones itself uh, absolutely so we invest from uh, software to infrastructure to the drones themselves pretty much everything within the segment as long as we see a near-term application of this technology and a near-term practical industrial application will invest in this. And again, in this sense, um, just to give you a range of things uh, where we're investing. So one of the companies uh, is a company which does wireless in-flight drone charging. So it's not the drone itself, it's part of the infrastructure. So and you could compare it to the, I'm sorry. Sorry for interrupting. Can you, you can name the companies if you want. And uh, uh, unfortunately at, the, at this moment, I can't for a number of reasons. I would be happy. Uh, to name it, uh, let's say, in a, in a separate private conversation. But again, it's easy to look up, so to say. So anybody um, is more than welcome. Uh, it's, it's relatively easy to find. So this is on the one end. On the other end, we're looking to invest in a company uh, which does software for certain real-time video processing, which is applicable to drone-related inspections. Um, again, precision landing pads, um, drones, or not drones, but systems which uh, a useful payload, which is used for agricultural applications of drones. So everything which, is, which has a very particular practical application which falls into the scope of the fund. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so if we started uh, this um, part, uh, can you please go more in details? What are your investment criteria or what kind of startups you are looking for? Meaning uh, what stage, uh, what um, uh, development progress, etc. So uh, for, the, uh, for the Autonomous uh, Solutions Fund, the stage where, so to say, stage agnostic with one limitation. We need for the technology to be proven. We don't care if there is no commercial traction, we'll take care of that. However, uh, we wouldn't like to take on any technological risks. There are a few exceptions to this. One of the exceptions would be batteries. So we are actually looking right now at uh, uh, any technology in rechargeable batteries space, which however has to comply to certain uh, requirements as in reaching more density more than 400 watts per hour per kilogram and we're now looking at a couple of companies which are already in the very late stage and they have solutions but they're extremely expensive and now starting to talk with a couple of other companies which are promising and their their technology is almost there so there are a few exceptions to this but in most of the cases we're happy to invest in a startup as long as the technological part has been resolved. 
Mm -hmm. So you no. mean a working prototype or pilot or anything? Uh, working, yeah, working prototype is uh, that's something which which already would be quite sufficient. As long as we see it's a working prototype and there are no substantial risks to the technology. Oh, that is awesome. So actually you invest in uh, early stage uh, seed, uh, pre-seed funding as well. Well, uh, again, let's, we don't really care if it's pre-seed uh, as long as the technology is working. There are very few pre-seed companies in tech space where the technology is proven. Most of the cases, uh, it's something where, you know, a very basic concept is proven, but there is still a long way from there to even a working prototype. So again, as long as the technology is there, as long as it's part of our value chain, we'll invest. But we also have investments in companies with revenue more than 10 million, in one case, actually more than 30 million US. So it's not in this, in this particular case for us, it's not that much about the commercial traction. It's about the technology and if it fits our vision for the application of this technology. <laughs> but when you say, uh, when it comes to the investments from fund, um, do you mean that you, in parallel, uh, act as a business angel or private investor with the group of... So, uh, to, be, to be honest, I used to invest outside of this thesis, but uh, lately I've been focused only on that. So basically, I've been, maybe for the past year and a half, as I've seen this trend emerging, I've been cutting out all of the, um, let's say, areas which are outside of this domain and have been focusing on doing more investments within, uh, within this particular thesis. So yes, I also act as a business angel, uh, but again, compared to maybe four years ago where I would see any deep tech company, I would have jumped into it as long as I like it. Now I see a lot of things which are really appealing and there's amazing technologies and you look at them and you say, wow, I really want to invest. But uh, then you say, okay, focus. There is, there is a thesis, there is a purpose for these investments. Okay, so yeah, focus is, uh, and prioritizing is um, actually the challenge and the problem for many entrepreneurs as well, not only for investors. I can imagine how difficult it is to skip the opportunities in parallel fields, but which not rely on your focus. Um, speaking about, uh, you mentioned that you are stage agnostic. What about regions? Regions as well, technically speaking. <clears throat> I mean, we've invested in companies which are, headquartered in the US and located in the US, headquarters in the US and but really located in Russia, uh, European companies, uh, looking now at one Asian company. We haven't yet uh, invested in any company in Latin America, uh, but again, we don't have anything against it. So actually there will be great companies with proven technology uh, from Africa, Latin America or emerging world, uh, you will be able to consider it at least, not putting limits on the regional presence. Absolutely. We make these videos in order to dilute geographical and administrative borders and to help you get closer to international investors, venture capitalists, market experts, and startup hubs, irrespective of what country or part of the world you are based in. And we need your support. If you like this video, please don't forget to put like button, to subscribe to our channel, and if you find it useful, I will appreciate if you share it with your teammates, co-founders, or social media networks. Thank you, and see you in the next videos. Speaking about uh, the uh, VC pass, uh, so you mentioned that you switched completely off uh, your angel activity if it comes um, on the areas outside your thesis. Uh, but uh, the question which we receive very often from startup founders, uh, which are interested about um, uh, VC, uh, VC industry uh, or venture capitalist mindset, uh, they ask, what, is, what actually does it take you, uh, SABC, to um, uh, 
to choose this class on a long term. What I, what I mean here, what they mean here is, uh, what is the worst and the best part of being a VC venture capitalist instead of being a uh, business angel or a uh, private investor? Oof, that's a tough one. I mean, venture capitalist as part, uh, working part of the fund, there you pretty much, you usually, again, doesn't really apply to the fund I'm talking about, uh, the Autonomous Solutions Fund, because that's a very special animal. But generally speaking, if you're doing a VC fund, you're purely, um, let's say it's an enhanced statistic play. Right, so you invest in a number of companies which fit the criteria and for which you sort of see the perspective of their development. But in a matter of speaking, you don't really care about each particular company's, the company. There is a lot of uh, statistics involved there. Usually as a private investor, unless you're you know, super angels like, uh, let's say, Tim Draper in the US, right? So there, for him, it's also a statistics play. But again, you can look at him as a fund. Um, in case of uh, private investing, most of the time you really do believe in the company you invest in, right? So you, you have, it's not just one of the bunch for you. It's not a statistical number. It's something which you, at least in my case, which you feel very passionately about. In one of uh, the cases, one of my investments, I've invested in a Spanish company uh, because I had a lot of faith in their product and in their future. And actually... Uh, had to get involved on almost operational level to take them from Spain and to the US to find a decent team there, um, enable the whole collaboration concept and whatnot. Again, it's, uh, it took a lot more time than uh, I initially envisaged, envisioned uh, dedicating to this particular company. But also now I'm, uh, you know, it brings a sense of deep satisfaction for this. As a VC, again, uh, of course, you're happy about the companies getting new rounds, uh, getting exits and whatnot, but in the end of the day, for you, it's a game of statistics. Mm -hmm. And uh, in VC, you feel more protected uh, risk-wise, or it is really similar, whatever it comes to the investment in the startups? Well, I mean, VC and investment in the startups on a personal level is pretty much the, the, the same thing, right? So the, the only case is as a business angel, you invest your own money. As, uh, as a VC, it's partially your own, partially others' money. So uh, in the VC, for you to be successful in long term, you need to perform on each of your funds. Otherwise, it would be uh, next to impossible to raise a new one. Do you jump on the boards of the companies you invest in? Uh, almost always, uh, with few exceptions, and uh, normally uh, the founders really appreciate it and value it, um, at least in the vast majority of the cases. Uh, in once in every while or in once in every uh, so many cases, you actually don't get along with uh, with the founder. It also happens, and then obviously. It's always kind of an unpleasant case on both ends. Yeah, uh, that is true. We uh, very often hear the discussions among startups that uh, they, they think or believe uh, that every VC wants to be in the board and uh, have the power of uh, making management decisions. Uh, but uh, in general, it is a huge responsibility and uh, for VC, it is a headache actually in many cases. It is, uh, absolutely. So the, the whole, it goes like this. One, you usually do want to be on the board of the companies you care about, especially if you can add value there, which is why if there is, even in a fund or funds where I've worked before, even if there is a company which is in the segment where I don't understand anything, such as, for example, FinTech, I would never go on a board in this company. I would add zero value. It would be a boring exercise for me personally. Uh, I really don't, don't care that much. I'm not passionate about this. However, if it's an industry where I, which I understand, where I can add value, yes, I do want to be on the board, but not to take management decisions. Basically, uh, I've joked about this several times, but I really think it to be true. 
usually once you invest, you become uh, a slave to your portfolio companies. Or again, at least in the vast majority of the cases, the uh, founders, the CEOs, etc., uh, they value what they contribute. And most of them can say that I bring something additional to the table aside of, uh, you know, purely the, the financial aspect. So that's exactly this topic, bringing additional value on the board. It comes to smart investments, correct? <laughs> I don't know how to how to call it, and many times it's not even on the board. In one particular case, uh, I am not on the board of the company yet. I'm helping the entrepreneurs to uh, basically expand to other markets, do some introductions, etc. So, in general, I mean, once you invested money in the company, you usually want to help this company prosper. So you would do pretty much anything uh, you can and anything the company requires from introductions to helping them with their deck to figuring out certain operational issues, in some cases, even figuring out legal issues together with them and, and uh, with the investors. In some extremely unpleasant cases, uh, and it also happened uh, in one of the investments where you had to change the management uh, of the company. Uh, luckily enough, it wasn't the founders, but the hired management, but the management which was, let's say, actively mismanaging the company. And it was a tough and a very unpleasant process. But, uh, you know, it all, knock on wood, ended well. And when it comes to this kind of unpleasant situations, actually, uh, the management team and the founding team, they are not the same teams, yes? Uh, well, in my case, uh, yes, it, uh, it was uh, basically already a management which was hired by the founders. But I know cases with uh, other cases, with luckily which ha hasn't happened to me yet, and hopefully will not happen to me, where, you know, the VCs are over at war with the founders. It also happens. And also happens anywhere in the world. So it's not limited to... Uh, Europe, Russia, it happens in Silicon Valley, it happens in China, it all depends. Yeah, absolutely, I agree with you. It happens very often and uh, irrespective of region, nationality, market, segment, etc. Well, um, I wouldn't say very often. Very often, uh, if it happened very often, I really would prefer not to, be a, <laughs> not, not to be a VC. Usually, when you invest in the company, you, again, most of the time, you have enough interaction with the founders to understand that they are reasonable people. It's an, um, honestly speaking, in very few cases where you make your decision without having, let's say, had an extensive personal interaction with the, uh, with the management team and they look reasonable and they sound reasonable. But then in the end of the day, you know, uh, you look at the results and the performance after some time and you see that basically people are just sitting there for the salaries. They, don't, they, they have a small stake in the company. They care more about getting their paycheck than about company actually reaching some results. And in that case, yeah. Uh, I, I was meaning uh, not uh, very often like a daily issue, but in comparison with uh, when it comes to public cases, because in public, publicly, uh, it is more uh, used uh, to discuss success cases than uh, failures, conflicts and other shit, which is usually happened um, under the closed doors. So, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, how, what would, what would you advise uh, to the investors and uh, maybe startups as well, uh, if uh, it is possible, uh, how to avoid uh, these kind of situations when uh, uh, the investor and the startup uh, can be not on the, not on the one uh, wave or can uh, share different points of view, how to deal with that in order to avoid the conflict? Well, I wouldn't say anything new probably, but A, it's explore the personal chemistry. I mean, in the end of the day, when you're getting into an investment and it's a serious, tangible investment for you, it's something where you need to understand and sort of like the team you're investing in, right? So if you feel that like each and every conversation with them is exhausting for you, for one reason or other, it's probably already not a good idea. Uh, even if the company looks great, etc., but you feel that 
they need a lot of you know strategic uh, sort of guidance and whatnot it's definitely not a good idea for you to invest in this company because you will have to be interacting with them for a long time and it will be an endless frustration for you and the second part is basically aside of you know the typical due diligence you do on the company is you need to spend quite some time quite uh, quite some time with the founders slash management team to see their vision to see how they're going to move this company ahead and basically also experiment and explore how do they react to certain ideas pitch them something you really think pitch them another stupid one see how they react and like uh I, i'm not even joking about this i mean um you need to also pitch an idea with which somebody will absolutely vehemently disagree. And basically uh, it's to understand that people are not just saying, okay, yeah, 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 sure, sure. We'll do this. We'll do this. Just give the money and uh, we'll figure this out. Uh, you need to see that the management has their own vision, has their own understanding of how to move this company forward. This is the, the most important part, but be that they're technically open to, suggestion pro, uh, suggestions provided these suggestions are reasonable and that they're firm enough not to accept any stupid suggestions so it's basically doing the due diligence and the very same way uh, for the founders to do their rdd on investors uh, even more on a personal level than um, on the fund itself i mean even in the really huge funds uh, like top funds in the silicon valley and whatnot it matters who is going to be working with you because again for the large funds you have one partner with amazing well one two or three partners with amazing reputations but maybe you're not the company they're going to be spending their time with and maybe you'll see them once every quarter four or five minutes and they'll listen to the report and say oh, okay okay that's great and uh, we'll walk off so you're not going to get uh, what you need and you'll get some uh, other either partner or whoever who is uh, who doesn't even share your vision he will try to say you know what what you're doing does make sense you need to pivot the company activity towards this and that and maybe that's even a reasonable idea but this goes com completely against your personal convictions so it's going to create a conflict sooner or later anyway so just make sure the person you're working with is somebody reasonable is somebody you don't dislike at the very least communicating with and you should be okay. I really love your idea of uh, exploring personal chemistry, uh, asking questions which uh, maybe will taken uh, negatively um, by he or she, uh, and uh, with uh, which uh, person will disagree. But wouldn't it be the guarantee that uh, the person will, or, or at least huge risk that the person will uh, consider you being insane and uh, from here Oh, wait, wait, wait. We're not talking about completely insane solutions, uh, okay. uh, completely insane suggestions. We're talking about something which, for example, uh, I don't know, in any particular case, you may not believe yourself that direct marketing is a good choice, but you always can ask, like, what do you think about doing a direct marketing of this? And hear how the founder or the uh, management or person from the management would say, well, you know what? Mm, really doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense because kind of we're targeting this very specific uh, segment which works along these rules. Does make sense to make marketing in this way. So they'll explain it to you and you also see how they react. So again, when I'm saying propose something stupid doesn't mean like propose uh, to a drone company, how about you hire a bunch of people and start delivering pizza? Uh, so, okay, okay, I mean, everything within reason. Great clarification. Thanks a lot, Vadim. Uh, another question is uh, that uh, you mentioned about pitching a startup to investor or idea to the partner, uh, but investors also pitch to investors, like for example, funds during the fundraising process, they pitch to uh, LPs, private investors and institutionals. And in these regards, I would like um, to ask you, can you explain in your own words, what is the benefit uh, or the perspective of the traditional VC model, because um, in the, the recent 
months we see some discussions that the traditional DC model experiences uh, difficulties. Even Mark uh, Anderson uh, summarized that actually in the venture capital industry you've got 20, 30 or 40 uh, boutique venture capital firms with huge returns which make LPs happy and you got hundreds uh, of um, other VC firms which do not deliver the results. So how do you uh, explain your LPs, the main advantage value, USP? <laughs> so first of all, I believe that, I, I believe in a couple of things. First of all, the VC industry has been like this pretty much uh, forever. I mean, it goes through certain cycles and in each cycle at one point there is too much money and it's being spent uh, not too wisely investing at huge valuations in different companies. We won't name any names here, uh, but I mean, they're all in the press already, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but in the end of the day, as you very correctly mentioned, each particular fund is a project in itself. You come and you pitch to ULPs why you think this fund is going to be successful because your thesis is unique, because your experience and expertise is unique, because your access to the deal flow is unique, uh, anything else. And the LPs make their decisions. For them, at least for the vast majority of LPs, it's also sort of many times a numbers game. They're invested in 15, 20 different funds. They'll look at certain things, they evaluate, they evaluate their expertise, they evaluate the field of uh, uh, the your particular, like uh, your investment area, um, how are you planning to execute your deals, what's your overall thesis and whatnot, and they judge you on this. So even I can tell you a, a very different case. Again, I cannot tell the name of the fund, but uh, it was a fund in a, um, let's say, nascent industry, uh, which was just, you know, beginning and it was, I think, the first fund they made back in 2006 or thereabouts. And they came to their LPs and said, you know what, guys, in this particular industry, it won't really take off for the next five years. However, we need now about 30 million in funding to start investing in each and every startup which we see promising. And on the first fund, we may actually not make any money whatsoever. However, this is sort of a seed investment for us to be positioned to be the leaders in this particular vertical, which is bound to explode over the next five to 10 years. And they managed to find, uh, and again, 30 million uh, for the US is, not, uh, is really not huge money. So they, they were able to find, let's say, uh, LPs with a proper vision, who actually gave them this 30 million. They really did invest in outstanding companies in the segment. It took for the companies for a very long time. Well, some obviously went under, but others, <clears throat> the one who thrived, the one that thrived, uh, they created a reasonable upside for the first fund. But for, for the second fund, they came to the LPs, to the same LPs and to the new ones and said, guys, you know what? We know everybody in the industry, literally everybody. We basically, we've spawned, we've seeded this industry uh, for the past five years. So now, how about you give us a lot more money and we're definitely going to perform well. And I think they're on a very decent uh, track now. Again, unable to give the name for, for a set of particular reasons, but uh, that was their pitch. And their pitch was in a, in a way unique. I really was uh, amazed by this approach. Yeah, that, I should have thought about this a few years ago with the drones. <laughs> that, that is a good example, really. Uh, and I think that this uh, answer should uh, at least uh, make LPs uh, think uh, positively in advance and uh, consider... Actually, it does. When somebody tells you up front, like, look, guys, we're looking at a bigger plan, a bigger picture and whatnot, so that impresses. Now, though, in, in my particular case, I go pretty much the other way around. I'm saying, look, we're not investing in something which 10 years from now is going to be absolutely amazing and huge. We're investing in something which will give the first results within the next six months. You'll see the first kind of joint implementations with customers of the joint, of the joint solution. And that also it makes sense for a lot of people. 
So it's uh, because it's a very fresh alternative to, uh, unfortunately, what's now happening in this segment in Silicon Valley, where you you come to a lot of pitches and there are people from Harvard, Stanford, really good universities, MIT, and they say, you know what, we're building this super modern electric autonomous passenger aircraft, which is going to dominate the world in the next six years. Here are the plans. Uh, here are the buyers of the team. We just need for now 20 million to start with, and maybe we'll do a next round of 100. And then, you know, Boeing or Airbus or whoever has already pre-ordered for 100 of aircrafts like this. What they fail to mention is that okay, the first aircraft they will produce is going to arrive in the next maybe four years if they're able to produce it. And Boeing or Airbus or whoever will only buy this if this aircraft meets a set of very specific criteria, which are not going to be met. And again, unfortunately, without uh, putting any names, uh, there is a very good case of a huge, probably the biggest investor in the world having invested 150 million in an idea of an aircraft of a certain type, which would soon dominate um, the industry. And basically about a year and a half into the project and uh, more than a half of the 150 million spent, uh, this particular investor realized, you know what, nothing's gonna happen. It was a free experiment for the other company. So things like this is what unfortunately turns away many investors from the uh, kind of from the topic of uh, UAVs. So in my case, I had to pitch it in a very different way. I was saying, guys, we're never looking at something or almost never looking at something which is more than three years away. We're almost always looking at something which is six months away at worst. And this is kind of our value proposition. We're investing the technologies of the future, but in the solutions which are required today, not in the distant future technology of the future, but the solutions which required today. I, I, I like uh, how it sounds. Uh, does it mean that your investors can return, uh, can have return faster uh, in uh, six months? No. In one year? No, obviously uh, the investors themselves won't get the return that fast. However, in general, uh, in several cases, we have, let's say, large investors who are looking at this and saying, guys, you know what? Once you prove you can do this, we would be happy to either buy out part of the fund or maybe buy out the entire sort of value chain. So this would lead to a much faster exit. Even though I'm not sure that I like this idea, I'd rather, you know, kind of uh, write this story for about the next three years. But this fund is one of the other differences is it's shorter than the most, uh, than most of the traditional funds. You know, the traditional VC fund, is usually something like eight plus one plus one. So eight years normal lifetime plus a couple of extensions, one year each, depending on the conditions. Especially in the uh, So in our case, it's five plus one plus one, but actually I don't even think the, uh, the plus ones are gonna be necessary. So. Uh, that's anyways. funny that we speak about uh, this uh, topic just a few days after Elon Musk uh, have uh, sent his uh, commercial uh, spaceship uh, uh, and uh, had successful uh, jump to the space. So uh, it seems that uh, after uh, this happened, a lot of investors become, became uh, private investors, became more proactive in uh, negotiating with uh, different funds and jumping SLPs. Uh, did you feel it? Well, it happened too recently. I wouldn't say I already uh, felt that people started knocking on the door just because of this, no. Uh, but again, you know, actually the industry ha has been going through ups and downs, right? So uh, a few months ago, another company which was quite, uh, quite interesting in a similar space, OneWeb, has basically uh, filed for bankruptcy, which was sort of, you know, a negative trend in the whole industry. But again, those are the companies which you know require hundreds and hundreds of millions. And for me, it feels a little bit like a casino bet. I unfortunately, uh, again, I just don't think I can afford doing bets like this. I go for the, which is why I, what I mentioned, like the investments are being done in companies where the technological part is resolved. So at least the technology is 
either one of the best in classes or normally unique. And there is no risk like this because again, um, you put me three years back and give me a hundred million and somebody like Elon Musk says, would you invest in, invest in SpaceX? I probably would still say no, even knowing what I know now. It's too much of, it's too much of a, of a bet. Now today it took off. Tomorrow, who knows if it's going to be something very consistent and whatnot. So if it's, if I have a check of a few billion, then yes, a hundred million, I would most definitely put there. But uh, otherwise it's, you know, it's a casino bet, unfortunately. Anything which is more than a couple of years away for me is uh, a bet which is too uncertain. <laughs> But in last question for today, uh, uh, unfortunately, because we're limited with time, and we definitely need uh, to make one more interview with you, digging deeper into the industry topics. You are such a, an interesting speaker. So uh, the last question for today is, uh, um, what actually should uh, the startup founder consider before reaching you out and when pitching you? his or her startup in order to get funds from either advanced uh, solutions fund or um, QS group. So what should consider, keep in mind? So, uh, for TUS, so first of all, for every founders, many times you get huge mismatches in terms of industry. Even though on my like even LinkedIn page, it says deep tech only, etc. People come by with marketplaces, with uh, consumer goods companies, with everything. So for me, even if the company is absolutely amazing, I would not invest in it, not because I don't believe in the company. It may be a perfect company, but it's just not a good fit for me. So a fit in terms of the industry, in terms of the stage. So TUS right now, the active TUS fund is the one that invests anywhere between 30 and up to 150 million. So we're talking about very late stage companies in Europe or Asia. Um, and uh, should cases like this appear, by all means, I welcome all the pitches related to that. For uh, Advanced Autonomous Solutions Fund, the uh, basic principles is if you see that a certain problem within the unmanned applications, within unmanned logistics, unmanned inspections or whatnot, if a certain problem has not been solved, and you have a solution for it, a certain, it can be a very small niche problem, but which is a showstopper for everything. Like for example, um, autonomous swap of the battery in the drone, or for example, uh, a smart mailbox, which would get the payload from the drone and uh, provide the payload for the drone in a fully autonomous way without involving a human being. These things are of interest. Another drone company, I doubt it unless it really like represents something completely new, completely different from all of the things which exist today. So just look for a problem which has not yet been solved and it may be even a very small, very niche thing, but it can be blocking a multi-billion dollar industry from complete disruption. And if this solution is not in the deep tech field, I mean, uh, for example, if the solution is just an application on software, which can change, be the game changer. Same thing. As long as it solves a problem, which yet in the field, for example, of unmanned logistics has not been solved, by all means, do reach out. Okay. Thank you very much for this, guys. Did you listen to this? Please uh, consider your projects and if uh, you heard something from Vadim, which uh, you understood you are actually doing or solving, uh, reach out to in mind or Vadim directly, pitch your startup, don't hesitate. He is open-minded and he is looking for solutions uh, which can disrupt the industry and solve uh, the problems. Vadim, thanks a lot. I really enjoyed the interview and I wish you great success with the new fund. Hope that you will collect 100 million as soon as possible <laughs> and uh, spend them wisely in the future unicorns. Thank you very much. Bye to you, Nelly. Ciao.